On the night of November 11, 1940, 21 biplanes from Royal Navy aircraft carrier launched a surprise attack on the Italian fleet anchored in the port of Taranto. The Italian ships were protected by anti-torpedo nets and surrounded by barrage balloons and anti-aircraft defenses. They thought they were immune to an air attack. However, in less than two hours, the swordfish torpedo bombers struck three battleships and several cruisers and severely damaged the port installations. The Royal Navy gained effective control of the Mediterranean, losing just two aircraft and four crewmen. It was the first time carrier-borne aircraft had been used in an attack on heavily defended warships. The raid not only revolutionized naval warfare, it also changed the course of history. Other navies took a keen interest in the Royal Navy's use of an aircraft carrier to launch an attack at long range, particularly the Japanese Imperial Fleet. Just over a year later, the Japanese would use the aircraft carrier to launch an assault on the American fleet in Pearl Harbor. From the earliest days of aviation, navies began to look into the possibility of using seaplanes for observation and reconnaissance. In 1910, exactly 30 years before the raid on Taranto, the American aviator Eugene Eli demonstrated another way of using air power at sea by making the first flight from a warship. He flew a Curtis biplane off a platform mounted over the bow of the battleship USS Birmingham. Eli's success led to further experimental flights by daring young officers in other navies. But before World War I, the commanders of the world's major fleets were not interested in developing air power at sea. For them, the mighty battleship remained the cornerstone of naval power. They believed that a clash between these leviathans would decide the outcome of the next naval war. Britain raced against Germany to build more dreadnoughts, the revolutionary old big-gun battleships the Royal Navy introduced in 1906. Other navies followed suit. The Italians launched their first dreadnought, the Conte di Cavour, in 1911. But its arrival overshadowed an Italian achievement which would have much greater significance for the future. In the same year, Captain Guidoni dropped a torpedo from the air for the first time. When World War I began, Britain's Royal Navy changed its views on air power and moved swiftly to get aircraft to sea for reconnaissance. Ferries were converted to accommodate the planes. The Royal Navy also built a takeoff deck over the forward turrets of the battlecruiser HMS Furious. At first, seaplanes took off from this deck, but they still had to land on the sea and be winched back on board. They experimented by launching Sopwith Pup fighters off the deck. These could attack enemy reconnaissance aircraft and airships, but they still could not land back on the ship. Once the fighter's mission was completed, the aircraft had to crash land into the sea. With luck, the pilot would survive the landing. Experiments continued, and in August 1917, Lieutenant Dunning made the first ever landing on a moving ship. He sideslipped onto the bow deck of HMS Furious and was hauled down by the crew. However, in a landing five days later, Dunning crashed over the side and drowned. To try to make landing safer, a second deck was built at the stern 
but the superstructure remained an obstacle and aircraft had to be maneuvered past it from a landing to the takeoff deck. The turbulence from the superstructure also made landing extremely dangerous. Of the first 13 attempts by pups equipped with skids, only three were successful. But despite the problems, the concept of deck landing had been proven. In July 1918, HMS Furious made history when it launched seven Sopwith Camels on a bombing raid against the Zeppelin airship sheds at Tondern on Germany's North Sea coast. Two airships were destroyed during the raid. It confirmed that air attack from the sea was possible. Designers soon realized that the solution to the landing problem was to create a completely flush flight deck. The first carrier with a completely flat deck was built from a former liner and named HMS Argus. It could carry 18 fighter or attack aircraft. Argus joined the Royal Navy in September 1918 and proved an immense success. The Admiralty ordered six more ships, including the Furious, to be converted to flush deck carriers. They were to be in service by 1919 for an ambitious raid on the German high seas fleet, sheltering in its home ports. But the war ended before this plan could be implemented. By the end of World War I, the Royal Navy had a commanding lead in naval aviation. Other navies were watching the British technological developments closely. The Japanese Navy introduced its first carrier in 1922, and two more large carriers by the end of the decade. The U.S. Navy introduced the USS Langley in 1922. It was capable of carrying 55 aircraft, a remarkable number at the time. Langley was followed by two more large carriers in the late 1920s. As more carriers were being built, U.S. Brigadier General Billy Mitchell began to show that naval air power could eclipse the mighty battleship in war. Mitchell organized several spectacular demonstrations using U.S. air power to sink obsolete battleships and German prize ships. But the many admirals in the U.S. Navy and others around the world were not convinced, and the battleship continued to be seen as the main naval weapon. General Mitchell was court-martialed for his outspoken views and demoted to the rank of colonel. After he left the army, he continued to advocate that aircraft would revolutionize naval warfare. He even predicted that the Japanese would launch an air attack against the American fleet at Pearl Harbor at 7.30 on a Sunday morning. Mitchell's views about the coming supremacy of air power were mirrored by those of the Italian general, Giulio Duhay. Based on Italy's development of heavy bombers during World War I, Duhay believed strategic bombing would win future wars. When Benito Mussolini assumed power in 1922, Duhay's concept of a substantial bombing force was given the green light. The Italian Air Force, the Regia Aeronautica, was given responsibility for all military aviation, including support of the Navy and began receiving large numbers of modern aircraft, including the 